you've tuned into Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, a video podcast series. Our episode starts right now. Here's your host, Dominique Vale. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, where you can check in for your dose of stigma breaking, empowerment building humor-filled life hacks for all of the medically adultish young people. I'm your host, Dominique Vale, the founder of Invisi Youth, and today is our second episode of our themed episodes all about invisible illness and mental health, which are all for empowerment and life hacks. So like I've mentioned before, the Invisi Youth chat sessions are a bi-weekly show where we get to bring Invisi Youth's lifestyle management tools to you in a fun new way. We get to bring in our guests to talk about all different ways to build empowerment and motivation, give you lifestyle tips and hacks for day-to-day life, and become an advocacy tool for you. So in our second episode, we're going to focus on invisible illness from a different capacity in a unique way, one that works with the health journey that I've also had. So for invisible illness topics today, we're going to focus on how you can straddle between um, invisible illnesses that are physical and you've seen them before and invisible illness that you don't see. So when you've gone through that transitional process between having an illness that is visible and not visible and what that's like to have been in both sides of the spectrum. So I'm going to give a little background on our guest today. Um, Her name is, as social media will call it, Paige Provider or Paige Moore in real life. Paige um, has gone through breast cancer um, from 22, and from that experience moving forward, Paige has used her social media to document her journey, and at this point now, she's at a staggering over 20,000 Instagram followers by using her social media platform in a honest and vulnerable way of showcasing Um, the journey that she's gone through and I always say her Instagram is probably like a motivational confetti bomb it's the most attractive Instagram you will probably ever find and you'll understand when you find her why she has so many people following her health journey and from that experience Paige has even been come part of what is called the Breasties and one of the an organization she's co-founded which focuses on being a support network for women with breast and ovarian cancer so I'm going to say welcome to our guest Paige. Hi thank you so much for having me I absolutely love what you guys do I'm actually a pre-viver Pre-vi- so not a survivor okay. I didn't actually have breast cancer so a quick intro um, all the women on my dad's side of the family had passed from either breast or ovarian cancer okay, all wow. of them and my mom is like the total shiro of the story she's like you know something's wrong here this should not be happening and so she did a little bit of research and this is when the BRCA mutation had come out people knew that they could test for it so my dad got tested for the BRCA1 genetic mutation okay. he ended up testing positive wow so then it was like an Oprah moment it was like you get a car <laughs> you get a car it's like you get tested you get tested so we all got tested um, my younger sister is 24 now Mm -hmm. she tested negative um i tested positive at 22 and i have a baby sister who's 14 who has not yet been tested and so basically what that means every single person in the world you me your friend your mom it doesn't matter who we all have the BRCA1 BRCA2 gene we all Mm -hmm. have it and it's your cancer fighting gene so every day they're there fighting cancer fighting cancer and if you know a bad cell comes in they're like get out of here and they kick it out Mine are mutated, so mine are broken. And so if a cancer cell comes in, I'm going to get cancer. Yeah. So my chances of getting cancer, breast cancer specifically in my lifetime, was about 87%. Wow. Which is like, that's not an if, that's a when. Yeah. And after watching so many women in my family struggle from breast cancer, I was like, you know what? That's not going to be me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I looked in the mirror, and it was the first time in my life I really struggled because I looked in the mirror and I was like, I'm going to get cancer. And every top I put on, um, any bathing suit, any time I touched or someone, you know, anytime anything came near my breast, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to get cancer. I'm going to get cancer. And that anxiety, that constant worry, it was driving me insane. And I really, really believed I was going to get cancer any day. And mm-hmm. I couldn't live like that. Um, and so I went and saw an oncologist. And she was like, you know, you have two options. You can either, for the rest of your life, do intensive surveillance. So every three months, you're either getting an MRI, a mammogram, insanity. Yeah. Or 
Once you're ready, you can take preventative action and have a preventative double mastectomy, basically ensuring that you're probably never going to get breast cancer. Okay. And that was when I was like, well, I don't want to worry for the rest of my life. This is what I say. I'm like, I went from being a warrior to a warrior. I went into <laughs> warrior mode and I was like, I'm going to kick cancer's ass. Can I say ass? Yes, okay. you can. <laughs> you can. Okay. We're good. We're good. We were I'm like teenagers. You're good. <laughs> okay, cool. I, you never know. I'm like, I'm going <laughs> to kick cancer's ass today and I'm going to beat it before it gets a chance to come near me. Yeah. And so I... I chose to have a preventative double mastectomy. And, and how that's young why were you with the, your mastectomy? So I tested positive for the gene at 22. Needed a little bit of time to wrap my head around everything. Absolutely. I just moved to New York City. I was working at my dream job as a TV producer. Um, and so I was like, I don't have time for this. And so then I got a little smart, a little wiser over the next two years. And at 24, I had my preventative double mastectomy, which was, you know, unique and amazing and unusual and all the you know things you can describe about it because I was able to actually prepare for this a lot of young adults um I think especially with invisible illnesses you don't have time to prepare yeah you know you're born with it or it's thrust upon you and you're like in action mode where you have to just fight 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 Mm -hmm. for your life and that's kind of the amazing thing about science and testing for these genes is you're able to know your risk that's why you need to know your family history. And then you can, you know, use that knowledge. We all say, right, like knowledge is power. Yeah. You use that power to prevent, you know, cancer or I'm sure a multitude of things. Yeah. So from the time I sat down with my oncologist and said, I'm ready, I'm having this preventative double mastectomy to my actual surgery was 90 days. Oh. And I, pr- I literally trained for that double mastectomy. Like I was in the gym. You bet yourself, like I was not missing a workout. Like, you know, we all have those days where you're like, oh, I don't want to get off the couch or you don't feel well. Mm-hmm. You can't get off the couch. Like I forced myself off yeah. my couch, put away the bonbons. And I was like, I am going <laughs> to the gym. I am lifting those weights. I am getting myself so strong for my surgery. And my doctors all said, they were like, we've never seen anything like it. We've never seen someone train for their surgery and your muscles and your body was so strong they're like we've just never seen a recovery like yours yeah i've actually had that with i had um, my spine started shifting i had scoliosis and then my spine dramatically kept shifting as my neurovascular condition kept spreading on my left side and when i was 16 it went from 14 degrees to 38 degrees and then five weeks later it went to 55 so actually my hips were off centered and I was literally limping because my feet were an inch apart difference when I would try to walk and so I lit I was laughing when you said 90 days because from the day my doctor said I think you need spinal correction fusion surgery it was 90 days to when I did and his suggestion was I need you to train like you're doing something so your whole entire back and core muscles are strong enough because we'll have to do majority of your spine with fusion and rods and screws so his suggestion was I need you to train like you're going to do something now wow so it was actually the same thing so when he said that he s- said you might be young when you're 16 having the surgery so it was nine years now but that was he said when you go in you have to prep that your body will be prepared to go through what it goes through even though you have no ability to see what's happening it's crazy yeah I mean there's no motivation like it there yeah. truly isn't and I think now I struggle where I'm like oh like I don't have a surgery to prepare for, so I'm like, (laughs) I guess I can eat a bonbon and stay on the couch today, you know. But no, um, I was in the best shape of my life, and I'm sure, you know, Mm -hmm. it motivated you too to get to the gym and work out and train, and, like, our core muscles are so important. It doesn't matter what you're going through, who you are, whether it's for surgery, you're just in life in general. Like, putting our health first is so important. Yeah. And I think going through this really showed me the importance of, like, taking care of our body. Yeah. Because we have one. Absolutely. Yeah. So going off of Paige's journey and everything like I, we do in the show, we're a little different of a chat show where we like to have different segments to talk about empowerment or life hacks and tips. So we get to learn more about Paige and the work that she does. And also we can talk both her and I and what Invisi Youth does as well. And we can provide different lifestyle tips for all of you in fun, different ways. So our first segment we're going to do is one of my personal favorites. It's called Illis Superlatives. So with Illus Superlatives, it's basically like a high school yearbook superlative. We're going to go through some of the best of Paige's life. We're going to talk about some of the best, whether it's empowering, motivational, um, funniest moments, and what Paige would qualify as that high school yearbook superlative. So Paige, did you you actually have a high school superlative? 
No, I was in the running for a couple, and then I didn't win any. Okay, so. what would have been, like, the one you wanted? When I was 17, it was best dressed, probably. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. <laughs> what about you? I had um, most outgoing, which I think is, like, very fitting. I'm surprised. Right. <laughs> um, and I actually was, like, happy. I was, like, oh, that's a nice one. Like, I'm cool with that. Um, I'm glad I didn't have, like most likely to marry rich or like you know something <laughs> yeah. like those are like so offensive i can't believe they get away with putting those in our yearbooks There's so many and then right? the photo shoots were always very entertaining i laughed oh my gosh yeah so <laughs> anyway all right i'm ready this is exciting <laughs> i love a good superlative all right so what would be the best piece of advice you've been given the best piece of advice i was given was to communicate and i'm going to talk about this a lot yeah you have to let people know what they, like what you need from them. Mm-hmm. We can't expect people to read our minds. And I think when you're going through something, whether it's a surgery, whether it's cancer, whether it's an invisible um, illness, I think that we kind of expect people to step up, right? Yeah. Or you want them to. And it's really hard for us to say, this is what I need. That's what we have to do. Like, don't make people read your mind because in the end, they're not going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed. Yeah. Um, so it took me a long time to actually come to terms with that, but communicating and like telling people, I just need you to be here or like, I need you to hold my hand or I need a hug. Like that changed my entire life and my entire journey. Yeah, absolutely. We'll always say the charity people, a lot of family and friends will say, oh, just call me if you need anything. I said, but you need to take that opportunity when they ask. I said, you need to see if they can step up. And if you ask and if they can't deliver the right way or deliver different things, that's when you can see, okay, certain friends, that's what they're good for my support. My other friends are good for fun times and lightening my mood. These friends can actually give me things and drive me places. So it's fun in that way, like you said, to really figure out when you take that action of advocating for your yourself when people do say I'll help you absolutely I agree with that I'm gonna cough really quickly I'm sorry I'm go ahead. <coughs> that was happening for a long time <laughs> <laughs> um no but I totally agree with you especially like after my surgery I think I expected my friends to step up mm-hmm. and understand what I needed or know what I needed and I never asked them and I ended up losing a lot of friends mm-hmm. because I was hurt and I was disappointed and I felt like they weren't there for me and now after like reflecting and meditating and thinking about it I'm like I never really asked. Yeah. And that's not really fair either, you know? Yeah. So it was a hard lesson to learn. I I actually lost friends because of it. But um, now I know in the future not to let that happen again. Absolutely. Speaking of friends, what would be probably the best reaction you can remember from your friends when you either, when you found out that you had the BRCA1 gene or that when you decided to go through the double mastectomy? So there's a couple that come to mind. I'm not sure if this falls under best, as in, like, most politically correct. And, like, oh, no, we do all spectrum. Some Good, people. Sad. I think, like, some people would be offended by this. Um, and there's – it depends on, like, the day of the week. Like, some days I'm offended by this, but some days <laughs> it's just what you need to hear. And so I remember when I went to one of my girlfriends and I was like – I'm just going to make up her name. Like, I'm like, Janet, I got to tell you this. Like, I'm having a preventative double mastectomy. And she was, like, at first took a minute to think about it. And she was like – damn girl you're gonna get some nice new boobs and I'm like and honestly in the moment it was like refreshing for her to just kind of make it light and just react and just react (laughs) and be like you got this you know (laughs) like I said some days I'm like okay this is not a free boob job and like it's not (laughs) this wasn't fun and I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy but then other days like you just have to laugh and like you know appreciate someone's sense of humor and like they don't she wasn't trying to do this in like a harmful way she was trying to like make it light and fun which is what I do a lot in life um but I think truly in general and the best thing like you can say to your friend like if you're a friend listening and your friend's going through something the best thing you can say is like what are we gonna do yeah or I'm here for you or we're doing this together and like knowing that like they're there for you and they consider it a we like hey we got this I think is like the coolest thing in the world yeah, yeah, we'll always say when we have siblings that'll come in for the charity, we'll always say, um, try and bring the motivational and the support first, and then if your humor wants to kick in for a response later, bring that second. Yeah. Because sometimes it's not the best opening line for a lot of sinners. That's a big tip we'll always say is, like, bring the humor in as your second response. That's really smart. <laughs> That's really smart. I like that. I think it's, um, you know, it's hard because they're going through this with you. Yeah. Um, I don't like to call people caregivers. I call them carevivors because I feel like they're really surviving along with you. And they're in this too. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's hard for everybody. You know, friends, family, 
the actual person, you know, mm-hmm. going through it. It's it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. And especially when it's not an, ex- um, an illness or a disability that you can see on your body when you're the friends supporting, it's hard for them to sometimes know how to support because they can't see what your body needs and it has to become very verbal. So especially for young people where they're not always communicating the best or all the time and it's a little more um, short-term or wh- how they communicate with each other, it's harder sometimes to figure out how to support each other and you have to figure out what your friend needs and how they like to communicate and then you can provide that support the best way totally I think it's hard I think it's especially hard for our you know young adults who you cannot see Mm -hmm. what they're going through for example you would look at me you would have no idea what I went through Um, looking at you I would have no idea what you've gone through and the thing is we all have gone through something but it's very difficult to understand what other people have gone through if Mm -hmm. you haven't gone through it yourself yep like I never had anxiety before this none and so when friends would have an anxiety attack I didn't get it Mm-hmm. I'm like, all right, like get over it. Like let like you're fine. Oh, I would say all of the wrong things cuz I didn't understand. Yep. And then one day I felt anxiety for the first time and it is all consuming and you feel like the world is swirling around you and the walls are caving in and it is like the scariest most overwhelming feeling and on the outside you have no idea that I'm mm-hmm. going through this, but I can really feel it and that's when the light bulb went off and I'm like, wow, like this is real. This is hard. And um, it, you can't understand it unless you've gone through it. Yeah, no, absolutely. So totally. going through this, I'm sure for you too, like yeah. you get so much more empathy. Like you understand people so much more mm-hmm. and you're a lot more forgiving. Oh yeah, absolutely. I have to agree. And going um, back to um, one more final superlative, since you are quite an advocate in your own right, obviously people will f- figure that out in the few minutes we've been on. What would be your, sort of your best way you found to be your own advocate? I think in order to be your own advocate, you have to really believe in yourself. And I know that's going to sound corny, like, oh, believe in yourself. (laughs) But seriously, you need to. Like, you have to do whatever it takes to put your best foot forward. Um, I look in the mirror sometimes and, like, I don't love what I see. Mm -hmm. And not loving yourself is really hard. And I think it going through this makes you so much more connected and in tune with your body, the good and the bad. And so you have days where, you know, you get up and your body's working great. And you're like, I love this body. Like, hell yeah, we're going to have a great day. (laughs) But then there's other days you wake up and, like, you're aching and you're in pain and, like, you don't want to get up probably and you don't want to move. Yeah. And you're like, again, like, I hate this body. And I think we all have these inner mean girls in our head that say these nasty things and we have to learn how to shut those off. And so in order for me to be my best advocate is for me to really, like, start from within and love myself and cherish myself and make sure that I am like doing everything I can to take care of myself yeah and then I can be an advocate for myself and then for others yeah but if you don't believe in yourself if you don't have that inner confidence you can't fight for yourself you can't put yourself out there and fight for others either Mm -hmm. no I think that's important absolutely and even going off of that what um, I'll always say is that sort of at the end of each day I can think of one thing that even just physically with my health has gone right I'll always tell other young people that if I can think of one thing even if it's as simple as I got out of the bed today and both of my legs worked I could feel both of my legs the pain was okay if that was the only good thing that went right the entire 24 hours I, I had one good thing It wasn't a good day, but it was a good thing in a bad day. And then I can always sort of build from there and move forward. So just finding the little tiny things and go, okay, everything didn't go wrong today. One thing worked right for me. And especially with health and having issues with health and both physically and mentally, that actually works of just trying to find the one good little nugget of something in your day will actually just like set you up for another good day tomorrow and then build up. So then you do feel an even stronger self-worth as time goes on. I totally agree. I'm like the messiest person in the whole world. Like my room is always a disaster. There are like piles of clothes everywhere. But I'll never forget at my college graduation, um, our speaker said, every day wake up and make your bed because then you'll have at least one thing that you accomplish that day. And when you start your day with a made bed, no matter what happens that day, when you come home, your room is going to be like, you're going to have a nice place to go to bed. And for a messy person, I was like, dun 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 like I have to make my bed like I am (laughs) I am messy I'm not dirty but I'm messy but anyway so now I've started to make my bed every day and it's 
that one start of like, okay, I accomplished this. Like it might mm-hmm. sound silly. Oh, great, Paige, you made your bed. But truly, you make it nice. Like you put your pillows where they're supposed to go. You put a little throw blanket on and you come home and you're like, this is my home. Like this is like a safe space, my bed, my room. And I know like I accomplished that one thing and you can build from there. Yeah. It really makes a difference. Try it. It does. No, Try I was it. just going to say, that's a life tip for everybody listening and watching is Try start it. doing one thing. No, I totally agree with that. So we're going to go into a different um, segment now. So we're going to play probably one of my personal favorite games. It is Life Tinder Challenge. Life Tinder Challenge. Swipe right. So with the Life Tinder Challenge, this is one of my favorite segments because it gets to combine humor and an informative chat. So we're going to go through with Paige some different um, topics, ideas, gifts that sort of theme within the invisible illness um, mentality and life that a lot of young people lead. And we're going to have Paige swipe left for no or right for yes. And she can give a little explanation as to why she might say yes or no to some of these things and what's going on in general society with the invisible illness community or what she would like. So are you ready? Paige? I'm so excited. Oh, I'm going to have to remember that the left is no. I, this is this is how bad I've never used Tinder. So right. I was just about to say, as a boyfriend, I never get to use Tinder. <laughs> I never use Tinder. I never get to swipe left or swipe right. So secretly, I'm, I'm very excited. To okay. It. So illness portrayals in TV or film, how do we feel? Yes or no? I personally love it. Okay. So I swipe, swipe is right, right I, the good way. For us, right will be good. We hope that's correct. Swipe right. There we go. I love it. I think that the more people that can kind of get a little insight into what it's like, even if it, you know, is through starry eyes or, you know, Mm -hmm. rose covered glasses, anyone talking about it, anyone like the mass is going in and getting a feel of what it's like. I vote yes. I vote yes. Yes. We always say one, we love that. And my only thing that I say is the big push is should be more inclusive with the actors they choose. People who either have those disabilities or illnesses or people who have that connection. That definitely helps if you hire Why actors, don't they do that? Hire actors who have these illnesses or disabilities. Why don't they do so that? So that, that is the question we always will argue for is definitely something we'll say. We work with a lot of people that say the exact same thing or they are actors with illnesses and disabilities. They're there. Right. Hire them. Right. Don't be like, oh, well they don't exist no they're They're there and also train someone it's not that hard like do you know push your movie six months back i don't know all the rules but like (laughs) push it back get a little media training you know and let's try like who they don't even have to act it's their life yeah exactly i agree yeah so i would swipe right but also we could do better yeah there we go swipe right but do better yeah that's our answer okay getting get well soon cards Okay, so <laughs> I I say swipe right okay. because I love a card, but there are some amazing cards that are funny and, like, real. Yes. I can't remember. Do you know the woman who she came up with these greeting card line? I think her name's Jennifer. I don't know, but they're like, I don't know what to say, but sorry, you're sick. Or yeah. it's like, this really sucks for you, but I'm here for you. It's like the realness of, like, I don't mm-hmm. want a card that's like, everything's going to be great. Because you're like, you don't know that. You don't know everything's going to be great. And listen – Not every day is going to be great. Let's be real here. Yeah. But I do love a card. I like the thought. And if you can put in the card, like, this sucks, but I love you and I'm here for you, like, there we go. There we go. I love it. So I swipe right. There we go. Okay. When friends suggest all of the new latest health kicks, tricks, and trends for you to try to help your illness. If they're saying... (laughs) try you know for example there's a lot of hormones in meats right so like a lot of my friends who are survivors um have gone vegan or you know don't eat meat they're vegetarians um or they're pescatarians so like i understand that but if you're like oh you don't need chemotherapy you can just eat well and you'll be fine i'm like okay come on or i've had a lot of people say well You know, if you eat well and you exercise, then it doesn't matter you have a mutated BRCA gene. You'll be okay. Swipe left. That is not true. We're going to put this in the left category then. (laughs) You can stick your yoga mat, you know, somewhere else. Where the sun doesn't shine, okay? (laughs) I do love yoga, though, but. I think you should be healthy. You yeah. should take care of yourself, but you should also, you know, do what were, your doctor yeah. says. Yeah, bring in the doctor. That's what I say. Bring in the doctor. Bring in the doctor. So when people ask, how are you feeling today? I'm guilty of this, so I swear <laughs> right. I, I want people to, like, people don't want to get asked that. 
Oh, a lot of times. Well, I think a lot of times it's usually the tone mm. or you get the you get people who will ask you every day or especially with invisible illness when they ask how you're feeling, it's because they genuinely have no physical idea of how you're feeling. Mm. So, we always say if you should pr- try to preface the how you're feeling today question with not saying, "Oh, you look worse today than normal. How are you feeling worse?" Oh my god, or you look really tired. Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks. Or like, you look wonderful for someone with a chronic illness. I get that all the time. So, I'm going, "Well, you know, that's that it affects my nervous system and connective tissue, so I would hope I you can't see it on my body." <laughs> right, right. That's so interesting. I need to You know what? I think I would say swipe right but with caution and ask people, like we said, like communicate you know what, how can I be a good friend to you? How should I check in? Because for me, I would want someone to be like, hey, you're looking gorgeous today. Even if I don't feel good, I want someone to tell me like, hey, you look great. How do you feel? Yep. That's fine. Not, "Uh (laughs) how are you feeling (laughs) today? (laughs) You know what? I don't know. I just, I'm trying to be much more kind and like understanding of others. And I heard this quote and it changed my life. It was, If we judged everybody, okay, so in life you judge everybody off of their actions and you judge yourself off of your intentions. Oh, I like that. But if you judged yourself on your actions and others on their intentions, the world would be such a better place. So always taking a step back to be like, okay, was that offensive? Did that hurt my feelings? Was that insensitive? Blah, blah, blah. Maybe, but let's take a step back. Was that, was their intention pure? Did they mean to be a good person or a bad person? And most times people have good intentions. So I'm trying to judge people on intention versus action. Yes. It's working for me. There we go. Because most times there's good intention behind some really some really ignorant actions. But at least when you see that they're trying, you can go, all right, I can then explain to you why I didn't have the best reactions. We'll always say to young people, if you don't like what your friends are saying, then explain to them why. I was just and about to say. They they won't if they do it again, then then we have other conversations for you yes. to have. But tell them why you might not like af- them asking you questions. My own pet peeve is my friends asking on a scale of one to ten, how is your pain today? Because oh. I've had about thirty nine doctors in my total of nine years and I get asked that question every time. So when my friends would jokingly say, On a scale of one to ten, how's your pain today? I would that would be the one time I would put my foot down and go okay guys that's not that's that's a that's a sore subject for me and they go oh okay I'm sorry and then they'd find another joke but always (laughs) you know I feel like do you remember that okay button it was like that big red button that oh yes the staples button the staples button (laughs) I feel like we need to create one that's like hold up and like you literally (laughs) press it and you're like hold up and then you can be like hey guys like thanks for reaching out that's so nice of you but and also what is one to ten like when they ask me How's your pain? I'm like, I don't know. I probably never really felt a 10 because, yeah. like, I'd probably be dead. Yeah. So, like, on a scale of what? Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't always. even know. I'm like, well, I'm in a lot of pain. That's why I'm here. Oh, yeah. So, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I always say I get very literary, fluffy, descriptive when it comes to my pain scale. I'll, I'll say, well, it's a 7 because of, and all my flower language comes out of trying to explain what a 7 feels like to me. And they went, I'm just going to write a 7. So, <laughs> But also, like, I don't know. I feel insecure where I'm like, gosh, they're going to think I'm like being dramatic if I'm like, I'm at a 9. Like, hook it up. Like, I need you to, like, <laughs> help me out here. You know, and I don't want to be like, oh, this girl says she's a nine. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, like, pain is relative to who you are and what you're going through and how you feel. Yeah. And, like, I don't think you can have a scale of one to ten that just fits the bill for everybody. Like, we don't fit in a box. Yeah. So if we had that as guys, it would be swiped left the other way. Okay, fine. Yeah, swipe a pain, left. A pain scale would be swiped left. Yes. So this, you might have actually gone or had some of these illness-themed parties. So whether it's remission parties recovery parties hope your surgery goes well party how do we feel about i am a swipe right all the freaking way (laughs) yes please i (laughs) love to celebrate you name it a holiday i go all out like we did a (laughs) galentine's day breasty event and it was like to the moon over the top like fully decorated that's just who i am if i can have an excuse to party i will life is a celebration people like we should be celebrating the good the bad like everything um so in the breasty community, a lot of women, especially pre-vivers, um, have, they're called Tata to the Tata's party. And you go and you have oh. this whole celebration celebrating your old breasts before you have to get them preventatively removed or even removed because you have breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's fun and it's light and it's like this last hurrah with this huge part of your body that you're about to lose. 
Um, and so I think, yes, like, hell yeah. If you want to celebrate your breasts as a woman, your femininity, like, you should go for it. Swipe right all day, every day. <laughs> I'm in. I love and that. It, Having even a, an illness party that's even for something that could sort of be a little melancholy for anyone to have, I think, even the way you explained it is it is sort of a bittersweet party tone to have that because they have to have or they're going to have a preventative surgery, they need to have it. It's, it is sort of bittersweet, but at the same time, you're going to have family and friends there that can laugh with you, have jokes with you, right. cry with you, and it'll be sort of a nice communal experience for you for sure so this is a little racy but um <laughs> one of my breasties who is my breastie and my bestie she's one of my best friends um which is awesome and i'm sure this you know translate across a lot of communities where like this just brings you real close real fast like you meet somebody who's going through the same thing as you and you're like yeah okay this is happening like we're connected um but so anyway she's my breastie bestie and she had her tata to the tatas party in um nola in new orleans oh wow yeah and so, I mean, come on, like iconic. How can you not? Yeah. <laughs> and I actually had been to NOLA um, a couple of years earlier in college and I did not flash, like no, not my thing. Like I was very modest and whatever. Hey, if you want to flash, do your thing. Anyway, so we went to NOLA and it was the best hot to the Tatas trip ever because we would go from like sitting in a circle, telling each other like what we loved about each other and what we loved about ourselves and like our bodies and having these really intense like, yeah, I call it like a yaya yeah circle, <laughs> you know, where we were just like, sitting around. Um, and then we would go out at night and like on our last night, we all looked at each other. We're like, you got to do it. You got to flash the girls. It's your last chance you're ever going to have with your OBs, your original breasts or original boobies. You got to do it. And we all stood on like one of these balconies and we all just lifted our shirts. I mean, mind you, I had my foobs, um, which is what, you know, I call my new implant things. Like they're not real boobs. They don't look like boobs. They don't feel like boobs. They're called foobs, like fake boobs. Um, so I had those. So those don't really feel like mine. So it, it felt different. I was like, hell yeah, I'm flashing. But we all just kind of lifted our shirts and it was like the most freeing experience in the whole world. Like no one even looked up. We didn't get any beads or anything. It was just for us, but it was like the best feeling ever. And it was sad and we cried and like it was, a, you have to balance. Life is about balance. You yeah. have to have the good and the bad together and you have to cry and you have to laugh and you have to celebrate. And so, yeah, swipe right. Sorry, I'm I love very long-winded. No, I love it. This one you might definitely swipe right all the time because I've seen it on your Instagram. But, oh, wrong. Clothes that promote different illnesses or activism. I feel like I've seen you wear some of these shirts. <laughs> I think I'm, like, a controversial person because I'm, like, swipe right. Hell, yeah. <laughs> I'm into it. You know, here's the thing is, like, okay, do you know um, Shop Bando? Yes. Okay, so do you know who Jen Gotch, the CEO founder, is? No. She's amazing. You gotta okay. look her up, follow her on Instagram. I don't work for her. I'm just promoting her because I like her. <laughs> um, shout out. <laughs> shout out, Jen. <laughs> Call me, please. Just joking. <laughs> anyway, um, she's amazing because she's so real and she suffers from anxiety and depression and she has panic attacks. And on her Instagram, she is so real where she's like, all right, like I'm at the airport and I'm having a panic attack and like, I don't want to be doing this. I don't want to show the world that I'm going through this, yeah. but I'm going to do it. And so she used her, her you know, platform as the CEO founder of um, Shop Bando to create necklaces that say anxiety, that say depression, and they're really cute and they're dainty and they're just like a little necklace. But I think, you know, it's amazing to be able to wear your stripes with pride, right? Mm -hmm. Where, um, you know, for me, like I love my scars and I'm proud of them and I'm, you know, these are my battle wounds. And I think that if I can put on a boob shirt, right, and you know rock that on the subway or rock that at a party and my one of my friends is like that's a cute shirt like I want to wear one you know and then you have a bunch of people just rocking these shirts like I think that's awesome and I think that there's nothing more powerful than the words me too or I get it yeah and you never know when you meet somebody you know let's say you're wearing an anxiety necklace and someone in the grocery line next to you sees it and they're like hey like I really love your necklace like where'd you get it you say where you got it she's like you know, I struggle with anxiety too. Yeah. And sometimes you can speak to somebody because you know they're being vulnerable. You feel comfortable being vulnerable too. Yeah. So I think anything that starts a conversation, good or bad, I don't care what you say. I think that's a huge step in the right direction. We need to be talking about it. And I think it gives everybody a voice because sometimes we don't have one, right? Yeah. Where sometimes like I have days where I don't want to talk about cancer and I don't want to talk about, you know, having this genetic mutation and so if I can, you know, still be an advocate by wearing a shirt that's like, listen, I am proud. I'm a freaking warrior. 
but today I don't really feel like one, I think that's very powerful. Yeah, no, especially, and we always say for invisible illness, either it's physical or mental health, when they have clothes or jewelry that does that promotion, that is sort of that, like, badass statement about it, even just saying we have, in the invisible illness community, it's like, I'm sick, but I don't look sick, Um, or even in the disability community, they will have shirts with sort of the typical handicap, quote unquote, sign of the person in the wheelchair and and have that person in the wheelchair celebrating with them or mental health statements about it. Um, for us, it's always, even if you're a friend that's healthy or able-bodied, wearing something like that shows your support. People get, it makes the conversation easier to start. I've worn shirts that say that I'm a mental health advocate and it, other people will just come up to me and be like, I really like that you're wearing that. And that's just it, it makes people nicer to each other. We always say, especially it's super supportive and if you're a little more shyer about your health, um, and especially with it being an invisible illness, wearing something is sort of a non-vocal way of making a statement without having to blast it everywhere of what you're doing or what you go through with your health. It's a nice sort of more muted version of promoting your own advocacy in a different way. So, and a lot of times they're super cute guys. So, no, I totally look agree. Them up. Um, my so my grandma Nana Cookie, <laughs> who oh. passed from ovarian cancer. Um, there's these shirts that say not overreacting, okay? <laughs> like ovary, like not overreacting. And so, you know, she passed from ovarian cancer, and I heard this story. I was too young to remember, but apparently she was, you know, w- walked to the grocery or drove to the grocery store, parked in a handicapped place, and she, you could not tell she was sick, but she was very sick. And I always, when I see that shirt, I'm like, I wish she could have been wearing that shirt this day because she went to the grocery store, comes back out, gets in her car, and some man had the audacity to be like, how dare you park in a handicapped spot? Like, you're not handicapped, you know, and kind of went at her. And it just breaks my heart because, you know, I'm not trying to be too nice to this man who I obviously have negative feelings towards. (laughs) But, you know, he didn't know because he couldn't see. And a lot of us, like, it takes seeing to believing, which is unfortunate and hard for, you know, people who have invisible illnesses. And so I think if she could have rocked a shirt that was, like, not overreacting, bitch like (laughs) it would have been really awesome for her and maybe he never would have said something or maybe he would have offered to help carry her groceries yeah you know so absolutely I don't know I think they can be game changing so swipe right I'm all about it cool and actually you just named our next segment title (laughs) by doing that so guys our next segment we just finished playing tinder so congrats to us for figuring out left and right um got some good matches (laughs) Our next game is is perfect for having Paige on. It's called Rebel Game Changer Status. Rebel Game Changer Status. So with Rebel Game Changer Status, we get to go through a more step-by-step guide of how it is to become an activist and an advocate for yourself and what Invisi Youth likes to call Rebel Game Changers. So we get to discuss different actions or situations that can either, from one spectrum, wanting you to make waves in the young adult healthcare community, all the way back to just wanting some ideas and tips on how to be a better advocate for yourself and your own health. And that's really important for people with invisible illnesses and disabilities because they want to be able to advocate when a lot of people will make comments because they can't see their illnesses or disabilities. So Paige, really what situations really have made you want to become more vocal and more of an advocate? Because you really did from the get go really, especially with your social media advocacy, sort of take those steps early on to share your story what made you want to become an advocate so publicly so I think I am an accidental advocate (laughs) (laughs) which we all can be which is amazing especially because of social media we all have these platforms Um, so I will never forget when I found out I had an 87% chance of getting cancer in my lifetime I went online don't recommend googling (laughs) any of your symptoms or (laughs) don't google like shut the computer but so I went online and I tried to find anyone who felt sexy and strong and empowered by this decision to have a preventative double mastectomy and it didn't exist um i couldn't find it and so everything was very negative very scary it was like people sharing the worst thing that ever happened to Mm -hmm. them and i just remember thinking like that's not going to be me like i just knew i was going to go through this and feel so strong and feel so empowered because i was taking my life back into my hands and like that is sexy to me like if when people ask me what sexy means like that's what sexy means yeah you know um, and so anyway, 
I accidentally became an advocate because my little sister, who I mentioned before, Cammy, um, she's the best. She's my best friend. <laughs> Shout out, Cammy. Shout out, Cammy. What's up? <laughs> um, she was 14 at the time, loved Instagram. Like, that was her thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to create this kind of like photo journal experience for her. I hope she, and I pray that she's negative. She hasn't been tested for the gene yet. Yeah. But if she is positive, she'll. I wanted her to have this whole thing. At the time, I did not know influencers were a thing. I didn't understand Instagram. I literally would post, like, my toenail and be like, hey, like, happy Sunday. Like, you know, like, I didn't understand what it meant. Um, I didn't actually post my toenail. Was fa- Paige's favorite Instagram yeah. photo. <laughs> um, but so anyway, I went on and just started posting and, like, not thinking – you know, this could become something. I didn't know I had a story to tell. I just knew I was feeling so strong and empowered, and I wanted to share those feelings at first with Cammie. Um, I wanted her to feel the way I felt. And um, it wasn't until I drove up to L.A. with my sister Cammie and my family um, because she wanted to take some cute photos. It was after my surgery, and she was like, let's go take photos together because that was, like, our thing. We would take really cute photos together, like, in front of murals and stuff. And so I was not feeling like I wanted to go do this. I'm like, I just removed my breasts. I was flat. I My scars were still bleeding. Like, I was really yeah. still healing and in recovery. Um, and I'm like, you know what? I'm do whatever it takes. Like, I'm be the best big sister. Let's go. Let's go take these photos. And so we went up to L.A. and I saw this hot pink wall. And I just, like, something came over me. And I'm like, I need to go stand in front of this wall I was still bandaged up, like, with my bandages and my scars out. And, like, I had this leather jacket on. And so I took off my top, and I was just wearing, like, my bandages and my scars. And I had these sunglasses on, and I just felt like a total badass. And I'm like, yeah. So, like, we take this photo from an iPhone, like, literally just one click. And I look at the photo, and it was, like, every feeling you've ever wanted to feel in your life, like, that's what that photo looked like. It was, like – good moment that's such a good moment to feel too it was like I felt on top of the world I felt so powerful I felt like so much feminine energy into the world and like I just felt like the universe was on my side and I just felt like I could do anything and I wanted to share that feeling with every single person because I think everyone deserves to feel strong and confident and sexy um and that's how I felt and so I that was really what started this movement of I can help other people feel like this too. Yeah. And so I started posting and I wanted women to see that you can be sexy after a double mastectomy. Yep. And my scars are sexy and I don't have to be ashamed of them. I don't have to hide them. I don't have to be embarrassed of them. They're awesome. And I wanted other people. I just felt like if I could feel like that, other women could feel like that. And I feel like I'm like your everyday girl. Like I could be your best friend or your best friend. <laughs> um, and so if my best friend felt strong and sexy showing her scars I could too so I just wanted to kind of be that person um and it just went from there yeah so even going from that I know you had said in the beginning when you were looking for other people that could motivate and inspire you you couldn't find many that were positively expressing their health journey and experience with having a double mastectomy or having cancer so what for you would be tips of wanting to of other young people wanting to sort of challenge that stigma or challenge that norm especially with Um, having health journeys that sometimes are visible or invisible what would be your tips of how to break stigmas that way my tip would be first of all be real because I remember I was so like focused on being this like positive light of like sexiness and strength that I wasn't showing the reality Mm -hmm. of the hard times and I'll never forget somebody dm'd me early on and was like you're glorifying this and you're making this look so easy and it's not and it made me take a step back and I'm like you're right it's not like I'm crying a lot like I'm sad a lot and I am you know mourning the loss of a huge part of me um and so that kind of woke me up and I'm like you're right like it's a disservice it's a fine line between wanting to show the reality and wanting to be positive and not wanting to scare people because I don't want people to be scared the way I was scared so you have to find that happy balance but I think you just have to be real and like some days you're going to feel on top of the world and you're going to feel so, like so strong and so sexy and so great. And then other days you're going to feel like you don't want to get out of bed. And I think showing both of those is so important. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, I was struggling for this past couple months, like this month, last month and this month with like my body and my body image and loving myself. And um, 
I could have so easily just posted on Instagram like cool photos of myself being like out here at the beach like doing <laughs> this like and just faked it yeah but that's not how I felt and I'm like you know what I don't love my body like I don't love myself right now and that's my reality that's my truth and I think more people talking about that like I want to see another woman being like you know someone I admire someone that I think is gorgeous and amazing being like I don't love myself and I want the community to be able to be like we're here for you like we got your back we love you you know and you never know because like for example I look at you and I'm like you're stunning like you got it all together you have you know you're balancing a career and a nonprofit and all these amazing things and yet like you might be at a seven today yeah and I would never know and so hearing you share that reality of like yeah I might look beautiful on the outside and I might seem strong and like I have it all figured out but like I have days where I am crying in the shower I want to hear that I want to see that like you can be this strong amazing badass woman who also like has fears and doubts and you know is sad sometimes because like we're not always going to be happy yeah and that's always what we'll say especially even with the chat session show that we wanted it to not be standing on a soapbox being sort of talking negatively about having illnesses and all the woes of dealing with chronic illness day to day and also not on the other side of it being rainbows and sunshine and I'm going to be climbing Kilimanjaro tomorrow which I physically probably could never do or even if I was healthy I probably would not be able to do I don't (laughs) have the mental focus for it Um, but it's just finding that middle ground of being able to be on but then also if you don't if you're having a bad moment just even putting just even saying that you don't have to always go into it a lot of times we'll have young people say I I'm not having a good time even just emotionally or with my health things are just every doctor I'm going to something is going wrong again and again but nobody can see it so they don't get it and then they start to revert and introvert themselves more and more so we'll always say just even saying it's just a bad day I don't want to get into it just sort of puts a stamp on how you're feeling and people can work around that you don't always have to explain everything we love when people do I was very private so when my friends knew I was having a bad day it was mostly just I'm very chatty obviously we have a chat session so (laughs) it works that way when my friends knew I wasn't talking very much they knew I was having a bad day or a bad week with my health and that was their gauge of knowing when I was trying to not get involved as much anymore so we always exactly what you say be honest with what's going on because if you try one way or the other you then sort of stick into that mentality that if you're always talking about the perfect rainbows and sunshine and the beautiful photos of being able to kick ass with an illness when you do have a hiccup or a setback it feels five times worse because then you're what what am I going to post about what am I going to tell my friends they think I'm doing amazing and then on the other side when you do get that sort of great doctor's appointment and all you talk about is how horrible everything is you don't know how to feel because you keep yourself in one mindset so it's always like you said take everything day by day and post the reality of what's good and bad I think that makes the best activism because you're being active in your own health care every day definitely so going off of that um what would you say um how would you say you advise others to use their um act their social media platforms in a positive way because a lot of times they will find people like yourself that they want to follow and they might want to talk about their health more publicly or even not on a platform but they'll see comments both negative and positive that you may get that our charity gets so how do you feel people or young people what would be your advice of trying to be remain positive about their health or how they combat people sort of the negative comments they may get um so my best piece of advice for this is what i so my instagram is always on purpose about three or four weeks behind my real life Hmm. always Um, I mean, you know, now and then, like, I'll post, like, a photo, you know, let me start over. (laughs) (laughs) So my Instagram is always on purpose about three to four weeks behind. I'll post photos from today, but my captions and my feelings, I always let myself go through those feelings first. And then I post and talk about it. So, for example, I recently post about, you know, body image and, like, really struggling to find that woman in front of the pink wall again. I haven't felt like her in a long time, which is really sad. Um... And so I felt like that. I wrote it all out in my notes on my phone, and then I let it sit there for three weeks, and I dealt with it, and I worked through my feelings and my emotions, and then I shared because then I'm okay. I've gone through it, and what anyone says does not matter, meaning 
yes, do I love a good comment and a good, you know, pep talk? Of course. And I could have used that in the moment. But also, you know, you get the comments where you have nothing to be upset about or how dare you not love your body. It's X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And those comments in the moment would have hurt and I would have felt bad or I would have deleted the photo or who knows what. But because I've let myself go through it and I'm okay and so, you know, I don't know, like so okay with what I felt in my feelings, it doesn't matter what anyone says. So I think, you know, letting yourself go through the emotions, like if you're having a really hard time, that's okay and you should share that. But maybe let yourself go through that hard time first. Let yourself heal before you share. No, because and I love that. That's such a great piece of advice because especially with social media and young people, it's sort of the the readily available ability to explain how we feel or I'm driving to a doctor or coming back um, and people do quickly respond or people then have their opinions on, oh, you went for this treatment. Well, I would do this treatment. And so it's hard then to sort of gauge. So giving yourself that breath between when you're reacting to it to when others react to it it gives you a little bit of a disconnect between then wanting to comment back. So I really, that's a really great piece of advice. I like that. I think it also helps you validate yourself mm -hmm. because yes, do I love my community and I love my breasties and I love like all of my friends. However, like at the end of the day, I spend the most time with myself and my thoughts are, you know, the most um, influential to myself. And so I don't want to ever rely on these comments because one day Instagram's not going to be here. Mm -hmm. And one day I'm not going to have 20,000 people cheering me on. And I'm going to have to cheer myself on. Yeah. And so I need to rely on myself, my inner dialogue to tell me, you go girl, or eh, better luck next time versus me relying on these comments. So I definitely think like, don't get too caught up in social media. Numbers mean nothing. Followers mean nothing. Like, yes, it's amazing. I love my community and I, please follow me. Like, <laughs> I, I'm not saying I don't appreciate the followers, but at the end of the day, like, that's not what's important. And so you have to get through your own illness, whatever that may be, on your own. Be strong enough on your own before you can really be an advocate or share your feelings with your community. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we, especially with invisible illness, will always say that often because it's it's a different layer to then add that when you can't see what somebody's going through, um, it definitely adds a different layer. So um, being able to advocate for yourself with a doctor, with parents, with siblings, um, those are the people that are around you the most. And then trying to become more of an activist um, and giving your opinions differently, that does help being able to be sort of self-aware of what works for you and what doesn't because there's a whole spectrum some people are very vocal and very active in promoting different types of healthcare treatments or what they're doing or talking to others where other people are very introverted and the most that they won't even mention on their social media that something's going on so it's just finding your own brand of social media you might just want to find a charity or find a group that has the same illness community of you or the young people you have especially with invisible illness and then just sort of support them in your own way but not talking about your connection to them it allows you to advocate without being an, an like an activist every day for your own self so I think that what you said really does sort of hit home for being a game changer because you have to sort of change the game for yourself every day totally I love that change the game for yourself but I think also especially you know, I can't even imagine going through this in high school, mm. you know, and I think a lot of your community are really yeah. young adults. And so for me, I started a new Instagram account. Like I still have my old Instagram. It's private. It's, you know, all of my friends from growing up and my college friends, my coworkers, and I started an actual new account and it wasn't on purpose. I wasn't like thought through. I did it for Cami. But, you know, now in retrospect, I'm like, that was the best thing I could have ever done is kind of separate the two because you are not your illness. You are not just, you know, I am not just Paige Previvor. I am not just BRCA. I am not just breast or ovarian cancer. There's a lot to me. And some days um, I want to, I don't want to think about cancer. Mm -hmm. Some days I don't want to be Paige Previvor and I just want to be Paige. And that's okay. And, um, you know, I'm not a psychologist, so, like, I'm not sure if that really is okay. But, like, for me, it's working. Um, but, you know, I think that for me separating the two, it made it also a nice transition for my friends. Because I becoming an advocate, like I said, an accidental advocate, it was almost overnight. My friends were like, whoa, like, what's going on here? And so I wanted to gently say, hey, guys, I'm starting this new account. Please feel free to follow my journey here. If that makes you uncomfortable... That's okay. Yep. I'm still Paige. 
here's my dog. Here's my toenail. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, keep following along here. And um, I think that it's so freeing to be able to create a new space where you can just be yourself. And I didn't think about, oh, is Johnny from college going to be judging me? Or is Rachel from high school going to be like, why is she posting a picture of her boobs? You know what I mean? And I mm-hmm. didn't care. I didn't think about it. And also I wanted to be respectful of the people who I'd grown up with who were following me and not just start throwing all these medical things out at them. I think like a warning is nice. And like I would have liked the opportunity if I took myself out of it and it wasn't me to be like, wow, what, you know, Zoe's doing is so amazing. I'm going to follow Zoe and I'm going to support Zoe. And it kind of shows you the people who are okay with it. And, you Mm -hmm. know, sometimes like the other day, someone who I was close with in high school who I had assumed was following me this whole time just started following me. And I'm like, oh, like, okay, you know what? Maybe it takes some time to get on board. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. You know, you don't want to, I think being a good advocate is understanding that not everybody is where you're at and you need to give them time to catch up. Yeah. I love that. That's such a good phrase. And we even say with illness defining you, we always say it's, it gives you, it's a very big part because it gives you the sort of scope of view of the world and how you view yourself and others and just sort of your day to day. But also it's part of, it's part of your definition. It's if you looked in the Webster dictionary with your name in it, there would be five or six different numbers of giving different examples of describing who Dominique Vale is. And one of those numbers would say, I have RSD, I have undiagnosed EDS and dealing with those, those are acronyms, guys, don't worry about it. Um, (laughs) So um, they would be parts of the different, different definitions of who I am, but it's not the only definition but it does frame a massive scope of who you are and and being an advocate that way is knowing that not everyone has number two and three in their definition like I do so they're going to look at things differently and then being able to advocate for the way you want but then knowing some people advocate differently and just sort of accepting that everyone advocates in their own way and is an activist in their own way and being comfortable with that is really important I agree cool So our next segment is um, a fun one where we're going to really tap into more of life tips and life hacks. This is called What's Your Life Playlist. What's your life playlist? What's your life playlist? Okay, so with What's Your Life play miss, playlist, this is where we get to chat with our guest about different um, apps, different shows, different things that they would add to their life playlist that help um, them handle their um, he- health situations. So, Paige, you know, we've been talking a lot about different um, sort of activist roles and how you've handled things. But for you, are there different, like, personal activities that you like to do to help yourself sort of emotionally, mentally, and even physically that, are, that you would suggest other people give a try with? I think the best thing that you can do is put your phone down. Oh, true. Um, In the morning, the first thing I would do is reach for my phone, go through Instagram, and start comparing myself to all the other people, what they were doing, what I wasn't doing. I stop that. I wake up an hour early now. I go on a walk with my boyfriend and our dog. I meditate. I do yoga. And then I start my day. But I think giving yourself a little bit of just you time, no screens, no phones, no nothing, to just be you is going to – it changes your life. It changed my life. Yeah. I know. I absolutely agree. I always say, give yourself every month, I'll always say, one of those weekends pick where you're not on your phone or looking at social media. And that is a really good way of just sort of like taking a breath and then going back. And then you can recharge and go back and look at your feet again. It'll still be there. (laughs) It's Um, not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. What would be sort of a a tip of a gift if you you had a friend that was going through a health struggle that you would suggest that either you've been given that now you start giving to other people or one that you would suggest people give when they have a friend going through a health struggle so I don't know if you guys are spiritual or not um I wasn't but now I very much am and so somebody gave me a like starter kit crystal collection oh cool and it was so cool it was so thoughtful um and now I'm obsessed with crystals and I have them all over my apartment and my house and I have them in my bag with me so I think like a starter crystal kit and I try to give that away now too or a good book like yeah. a book that you love I love to get a book that some they're like I read this I loved it I thought of you here's a book yeah, that's true. It, like, definitely, we'll always say, like, even, like, a gift card for music or going to get totally. a book is something that even if it is just simple as a gift card and you throw it in sort of a blank note, that's always a good gift because sometimes giving giving the typical here's some flowers, here's a get well soon card, um, sometimes <laughs> you want to, like, throw something in where that person goes, oh, okay, then I can, that's something I can read, that's something I can listen to. It's a nice sort of gift that also gives them a little bit of control that they can then pick what they want to do with it but no I love the crystal things really cool I like that I'm gonna put that in my my back burner for 
for sure. <laughs> Um, so one other thing would be, so what would be sort of, if you have any like tips on top, like health kick trends that you've either experienced, whether different exercise regimes or, um, food sort of kicks that you've seen, oh, like these are really fun, even if they're not medically related ones that you've really enjoyed. Okay. I love a good, um, I call it a breasty bite, but I'm not sure they're like, I guess they're like protein balls. You don't have to use protein powder or anything like that, but they're non-bake little balls you can take on the go. Um, how many times can I say balls in one <laughs> sentence? <laughs> um, but they're like, so I do um, peanut butter, dates. Um, I'm like totally blanking, but like coconut shreds, chia seeds, and like oats. And I roll, you just roll them up. It's super easy. You put them in your fridge or freezer, and then you can just take them on the go. And it's like changed my day because you really should be starting your day with something good and like with breakfast. And we're so busy. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'll eat on the go. And then I just don't eat. And so having these like little healthy bites that taste good on the go is awesome. I love that. That's a good one. We're going to end today with me talking about one quick little thing. So with um, always talking about being an advocate and especially with sort of stra straddling between visible and invisible illness, what would sort of be like your sort of final send off message to people that are in the invisible illness community that are sort of balancing between a visible symptom day and an invisible symptom day of trying to be with friends and family that sometimes don't see it or get it what would be your sort of go-to sort of message of empowerment for them be easy on yourself don't be so hard on yourself don't compare your day one with someone else's day 30 or your day 30 with someone else's day 100 meaning we're all at different places healing is not linear so there are going to be mountains and curves and ups and downs and you just need to let yourself heal at your own pace do not compare yourself to me on social media if you're going through a preventative double mastectomy and you're looking at my instagram and you're like well Paige was able to raise her arms after 10 days and i'm at day 20 and i can't raise my arms what's wrong with me no our bodies are different yeah and we're different and so be easy on yourself and don't be afraid to ask your friends to step up and be there and tell them how. Say, hey, Johnny, let's go to a movie tonight. I just want to, like, forget what I'm going through. Or, you know, hey, Rachel, let's um, have a spa night because I really am not feeling good and I just want to do a face mask with you. Yeah. And tell your friends what you need and you'll be surprised and amazed because they'll step up and be there. I love that, especially with invisible illness, when you did mention that going easy on yourself, because we might have the same diagnosis, but at the same token, everyone's body responds differently. And when it's an invisible illness and you can't say it, it's very hard to then sort of gauge, oh, well, my, my symptoms are not moving as fast as somebody else's. So it is. And even when you have different illnesses, sometimes you and I could have similar health journeys and we have two completely different health stories. So I think that's really important is be easy on yourself and that every day is just sort of moving forward and becoming better and better um, for yourself. So I, I really agree. That's a good ending note for us to have on the show. So Paige, how about you tell people where they can learn more about you and where you at, you're at on social media and the work that you're doing for yourself with the breasties? How can people find you? You can find me um, on Instagram at Paige underscore Previvor. So P-A-I-G-E underscore P-R-E-V-I-V-O-R. Um, and I co-founded a nonprofit with three amazing women. It's called The Breasties, and we do free events and weekend wellness retreats for young women who have been affected by breast and ovarian cancer. You can find us at thebreasties.org. I love it. I love it. And guys, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at InvisiYouth. And you can watch and listen this, to this podcast, InvisiYouth Chat Sessions, on YouTube and iTunes. So just search for us. So I want to thank Paige for being our guest on this second episode of Empowerment and Life Hacks with Invisible Illness and Disability and Mental Health. And we will catch you guys later. Bye.